By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Knights of Thorn, the 10th edition, the old school magic tournament held in Deventer, the Netherlands. And we have reached the semi-finals. Oh, this is exciting stuff. We have Carl from Belgium playing with a Chains of Mephistopheles deck. It is black, blue and red. And he is taking on Avert, who's playing with the deck that I've called The Goat. It is white, it is red, it is blue, and it's got that... Does it have the black splash? No, it doesn't. It doesn't have demonic to red mind twist. What? That is uh, something you don't see often. Anyway, we've got two killer decks going face to face, and I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. But before I jump into the deck decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to skip that section, go to the games first, check out the deck decks later. The easiest way to do this is uh, by checking the description below, because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games, so if you click on there, it'll take you straight to the games, and in that same description below, you can find more information about the rule set. In this match, we are playing Swedish rules, meaning no fall and empires and no mana burn and only one strip mine so now you're informed about that i hope there's no confusion and in that description there's also a link to the timmy talks patreon page because yes yes i have my very own patreon page you can find that on patreon.com slash timmy talks so please take a moment after this video perhaps to visit my patreon page and consider becoming a patron of the show and support me as a content creator it already starts for just one dollar a month okay and now that you're fully informed i'm going to start with the deck decks i'm going to start with the player on the left and that is carl let's take a look at his chains of mephistopheles deck and here we see the deck of carl so this is the change of mephistopheles deck right together with the rack that is how he wants to win the game. And I should actually really hate this deck because I only lost two matches the entire day. And two of them were, one of them was against this beautiful deck of Carl. I lost 2-1. And I have to say, Carl, you're just a really good player. Always have been. And I love the fact that you bring these type of decks, you know, to the tournaments together with players like Thomas Nilsson. It's just a joy to see these decks and also to see you do well with these decks. Um... So that's that's enough compliments. Let's now get into what the deck actually wants to do. So I'm going to try to once again explain Chains of Mephistopheles. So it's one black and one for an enchantment from Legends that reads, if a player would draw a card except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, that player discards a card instead. If the player discards a card this way, they draw a card. If the player doesn't discard a card this way, they mill a card. Now that, la that last part is quite important. In a moment, I'll explain why. But... So if you just draw your card for turn, it's okay. Nothing happens. But if I then, for example, draw my card for turn, I'm a blue mage, right? And I would then cast Ancestral Recall and I would draw three cards. For each card that I then draw, I also have to discard a card from my hand. So I'm basically looting myself, right? I'm not really getting any extra cards. I do get some card selection. So it's not all bad, but it's not even, you know, as, as powerful as close as being as powerful as a normal Ancestral Recall. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's the way that the Chains of Mephistopheles works. But it gets even sicker, you know? Because remember that second part, if the player doesn't discard a card this way, they mill a card. So what you can do, this enchantment turns your Winds of Change, your Wheel of Fortune, and your Time Twister into these mega discard spells. And maybe you're wondering why. Well, let's just Focus on Winds of Change because that's the card we're probably going to see the most. He's playing a full playset. So Winds of Change is one red, also from Legends of Sorcery, that reads each player shuffles the cards from their hand into their library, then draws that many cards. The problem here is that the moment that you start drawing the cards with the Winds of Change, you have no cards in hand. And remember that second part of the chains that says if the player doesn't discard a card this way, they mill a card. So you're drawing a new card with an empty hand. You draw one card at a time. You have no cards in your hand at the moment means you're only milling you're not even drawing any cards so winds of chains is um is a discard spell with chains of mephistopheles the same thing goes for wheel of fortune the same thing goes for time twister so that's of course is insane and then you can combine that with the wreck and the wreck is an artifact that says for each card in your hand below three you take a damage. So if you have two cards in hand, you take a damage. If you have one card in hand, you take two damage. If your hand is empty, you take three damage. And because of Chains of Mephistopheles, 
it's really hard to refill your hand. As a matter of fact, it's impossible because I'm just gonna draw my card for turn, nothing happens. But if I then, for example, would try to draw an extra card with Gem de Tome, for each card you draw after the first one, you have to discard a card, so I draw a card, and then I gotta immediately choose which one of the two cards I have to discard now. Uh, you know, I want to discard now, so it's kind of a Jalem Tome effect. So it's, it is really tough. Now, beside this kind of, you know, core of the deck, he has surrounded the deck with just really good cards because, you know, yeah, Carl always brings the good cards to the tournament too. So he's got, of course, uh, you know, Mind Twist, which works great with the rack. He's got Demonic Tutor. This is the card you want to have when you're looking for specific combo pieces. Um, he's also playing with Four Suchis, playing with Surrender Perfrites. He's also playing with Copy Artifacts. So, I mean, it's, it's a good deck. You know, he's playing with a Fireball to maybe finish it off early. So... You know, he's got this main plan, Change of Mephistopheles and, uh, of course, the Wreck. But he also plays with other really good cards that can help him get there quicker or that can help him finish the job. So, I mean, this is a good deck. I'm still a little bit surprised that it made it to the semifinals. It shows how good Carl is with this deck because I can also imagine that you can have a lot of games where you find the wreck, but you don't have the chains, or you have the chains, but you don't have a, a draw spell like Winds of Chains, you know, and it all just gets very, like, murky and slow, and your opponent is doing stuff, and you're really waiting to just draw into that one card that you're missing in kind of your combo plan. Um, so I can kind of see that it happens, but it shows how good of a player uh, Carl is. I mean, if he made it to the semis, why not make it to the finals? Uh, talking about that, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Avert. So I've called this deck the GOAT because I just thought it was funny. Atog is an anagram for GOAT. So I thought it was just funny to kind of put that in there. Now, uh, Atog, of course, a creature you see a lot. Three in this deck, one red and one for a one-two creature from Antiquities. Second artifact, give a plus two, plus two until end of turn. Um, you know, and I think an Atog, when it hits the board, people start to get nervous because with an Atog and enough artifacts, of course, you can win out of nowhere. An Atog can be very difficult to kill as soon as they're just... A lot of artifacts on the board so i think sometimes people get too nervous when they see the atok but usually you should get nervous because you know try to get rid of it as fast as you can but of course the deck is more than just the atox there are also four savannah lines in here and three suchis those are the creatures in the deck and then there's just a lot of pain in this deck <laughs> you know i mean everything in this deck wants to hurt you know the savannah lines of course work perfect in such a deck because it's such an aggressive creature, right? You want to play that turn one, have that two potential two power of damage the next turn when you attack with it. But looking at the rest, you know, we've got three Black Vice. We've got two Copy Artifacts. We've got two Ang of Mishra. So, right, Black Vice, I always say it's like an extra lightning bolt. If you have a turn one and you're on the play, you play it, your opponent will get three damage, right? Because for every card above four, your opponent takes uh, a damage. So if you've got five in hand, take one damage. If you've got six in hand, take two damage and so forth. Um, and then, of course, Ank of Mishra works really well with Black Vice. This is a very old combination of cards that I remember myself back in the day when we had these weird 100-card tournaments. Sometimes people would play these two cards together as well. And uh, Black Vice, of course, with, with the Black Vice out, what, what do you want to do as, as, as the opponent? You want to play out your hand. But then there's Ank of Mishra, and Ank of Mishra punishes you for playing land. When you play a land, you take two damage. So you don't want to play a land because then you take damage, but you want to empty your hand because if you don't, you take damage from the Vice. And to empty your hand, you need to play out lands. You know where I'm getting at, so you're kind of stuck in a catch-22, and I think that's really what this deck does. And to make matters worse... He's playing with a lot of direct damage as well. Four Lightning Bolts, three Psionic Blast, right? Psionic Blast, card from blue, can deal four damage at instant speed. So if we just look at the direct damage, he's got 24 points of direct damage on the board alone. You know, that is pretty heavy. Then he's also playing with two Armageddons, which I think are really good here because, you know, your Bolt is only one red. The creatures are pretty cheap. Um, if you've got an Ank out, you've got maybe a Savannah Lines out or an Atog as well, or maybe all three of them. Play the Armageddon, you know, say, okay, try to, to play more lands. You're only hurting yourself. Then you also, of course, have that Black Vice. If you play an Armageddon and your opponent cannot do anything, they're also going to take more damage. So that is really ideal. And then, of course, what works well with Atok? The jewelry. Atok is apparently a very fancy boy, uh, you know, who loves to, to dine at these star restaurants. And that's, of course, where the Moxon come in. By the way, this is a sick deck photo. It's all... <laughs> 
whole black bordered stuff. It's insane. And I know Avert, like his cards are like, they're beautiful. Anyway, uh, so we've got Black Lotus, we've got all the mocks, and we've got a Soul Ring. All that is just prime chop, you know, for the ATOG. It loves that stuff. Then we also see the Blue Power, of course, the, the, the Time Walk, the Ancestral Recall. I think Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune are also really good in this deck because one of the things that can happen with this deck is that you just play out your, your cards so quickly because they're so cheap to cast you run out of gas. Well, that's exactly where these like draw seven come, come in really, really handy. Time twist to Wheel of Fortune. I am not surprised to see this deck, uh, you know, here. And it, who knows, maybe it'll even win the tournament. So yeah, this is the deck of Avert, the GOAT. We already looked at uh, the deck of his opponent. And that only means one thing. We are ready to go to the semifinals of the Knight of Thorn 10. Game number one, here we go. So on the left, we have Carl. So he's playing Chains of Mephistopheles and The Wreck. And he's taking on Avert and he's on Atok with Savannah Lines and also like Burn, Ink of Mishra. It's uh, white, red, and blue. Let's first see what uh, Carl can do where he is on the play, starting with the Volcanic Island and a Mox Jet passing the turn. So that could have been a turn one Chains, but we didn't see it. And now it's Avert's turn to go. He's got a very aggressive deck, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some of turn one shenanigans. Taking his time here, so I guess he's got some options. Perhaps a Black Lotus in hand, thinking about a quick start. That could be one of the reasons that he's taking his time here. Going through his hand. And there we go. Okay, there's a Mishra's Factory and a Mox Emerald. There's an Ankh of Mishra. So this Ankh is, you know, fits perfectly into the game plan of Avert, which is starting damage as quickly as he can. So the Ankh means for every land you drop, you take two damage. That counts for both players. So here we see Karo playing a Factory. So that means he drops to 18. Tapping three. What else are we going to see? Oh, ho, ho, there's a turn two. Surrender of Freed. So... Early pressure, and of course the good thing about the Surrender is that for toughness, meaning that Avert cannot bolt it away. If he can find a blue source, he does play with uh, three Psionic Blasts. And I guess the good news for Avert here is, though, that of course the Surrender hurts uh, Carl as well. And that kind of fits the plan of, uh, of Avert. I mean, his deck is just full of damage, you know. Before you know it, you're like on zero when you play against Avert's list. But let's first see if he can find something. One of the lines that he could take here, depending on what's in his hand, of course, is play a mountain, animate the factory attack. If he blocks on the factory, he can then burn it to the ground with the bolt. But I don't think you really want to do that if you're Avert. But uh, let's first see what he is going to do. Looks like he's got a lot of options in there, and that doesn't surprise me at all, because his deck is full of cheap, um, cheap castable spells. So that means when you've got three... Mana, I mean, basically you can play out almost everything. I think the main concern here is, does he have the right color mana? Okay, here's a Plateau. So he's going to take two himself from his own end, dropping to 18. And again, here, kind of going through the motion. Okay, there's a Black Lotus. So are we going to see something explosive here? So with the Lotus on the board, it means he's got six mana to work with. Sacking the Lotus, there's a Psionic Blast. Has to take two, though. We'll drop to 16. And interesting here, of course, is that he doesn't wait for the upkeep of Carl. Because then he would have taken extra damage. And he plays a Savannah line. And he attacks for two. So that's why he wanted to play that Psionic Blast immediately. Because now he can deal two damage. Yeah, and here we see Avery reminding himself of the damage from the Psionic Blast. So he's on 16. Carl now is on 16. So by playing the Psionic Blast in his own main, it meant that he could attack for two and deal an extra point of damage. So that makes perfect sense. Well played here by Avert, passing the turn to Carl. Let's see what Carl can do. I mean, so much is happening already. Like, we've just passed turn two, right? This is turn three for Carl. There's a Volcanic. So again, damage dropping to 14, I believe. That Ank is really doing work. He's going to tap four. What are we going to see? A Suchi hitting the board. Both players playing with Suchis. So we're going to see a lot of those. 
So a 4-4 for 4 from Antiquities. When it dies, you get 4 mana. And remember, this is a format without mana burn. So that's quite good. We see here Aver dropping to 14. There's a green for a Soul Ring. So, I mean, these are a little bit too many uh, mana sources, I think, if you're if you're Avert. Unless, of course, you have a draw 7. Now, Wheel of Fortune would be quite good. It's going to tap 2. Are we going to see a Disenchant? No, we're going to see an Atok. And there's the pass. So this is a little problematic for Avert because his hand is empty. Remember, he's playing against a direct deck. I mean, he's got a lot of stuff on the battlefield, but... That Suchi for now is kind of uh, keeping the threats at bay. I wonder if next turn Avert is going to attack with that Atok. Ooh, Ancestral Recall. Yeah, this is really good, of course, for Carl. Going back up to, I believe, six cards in hand. Yeah, that is really good for him. So many cards in his hand, Avert having nothing. Tapping two here. One red and a colorless. What are we going to see for two? Copy Artifact on the Suchi, so two Suchis on the board. And there's the wreck. I kind of expected the wreck here to drop. So Avert now taking three damage from the wreck in his upkeep, gonna go to 11. And I mean, in that regard, maybe the wreck is also a good sideboard card, because so many of these decks now play with the Savannah Lines and the Burn and are really, really quick. And then if you have the wreck, you can kind of punish them for it. Anyway, one card in hand for Avert. Let's see if he can do something. I mean, could consider attacking with the Atok, decides not to. I mean, it's a tough spot here for, for Avert. That means it's a good spot for uh, for Carl. I wonder if he is going to attack with the Suchi. Carl also just passing. That means two more damage for Avert, dropping to nine. And I mean, I think Avert could now get into a position where his own Ankh of Mishra is going to be uh, a little bit painful for him. Of course, he does have the Atok, so he can just sack it at any time. Two cards in hand for Avert, also passing the turn. Next turn, he'll only take one damage. Another four tap, another Suchi on the board. I mean, the thing here is, if Carl would attack, uh, Avert can simply, you know... Animate the factory, maybe double block line the factory pump itself, you know, trade the Savannah lines for Suchi. You don't want that to happen. So I understand Carl here taking his time. We see Avert now on eight, by the way, drawing card number three. So if he doesn't play anything out and just passes the turn, then at least he takes no more damage from the wreck. But it looks like he's considering a play here. Looking at his hand, are we going to see some fireworks? We had a very explosive start by both players, and after that we kind of had this standstill moment with all those Suchis on the side of Carl. And also Avert here passing the turn, so deciding not to do anything. We also see a bolt there in hand by Carl. It's looking really good for him, tapping four more. Ooh, there's a mind twist. That is not only going to empty his hand, it's also going to mean more damage for him from the rack in response. Going to play a bolt here. It looks like on the life total of Carl, going to drop to 11. Losing a Mox there, but also an Armageddon. And Armageddon could have been quite useful with all the artifact mana on the board here. So, I mean, it's looking worse and worse and worse here for Avert. Now taking three more, going to drop to five. I mean, this is problematic, right? Only one card in hand. If he plays it out, it means another three points of damage next turn. He would go to two. We know that Carl's got a bolt in hand. He's so close to losing this. Tapping two. Okay, Wheel of Fortune. Wow. This wheel is exactly what Aver needed. I mean, he's still in a bad place, but Carl had this game kind of locked in. And now with this Wheel of Fortune, things could change. Is it really going to be a Wheel of Fortune for Aver? That's the question. Hasn't played a land, I believe. Does he want to with the Ankh, though? Tapping the duel. There's an Ancestral Recall, so he's going to draw even more cards. So that means he's got nine cards in hand now. Let's see if he can, for example, drop some mocks and to empty his hand. And now, of course, Avert has a lot of options here in the semifinals.
And that's the thing with old school, you know, even if you think, okay, this game is in the back for player A, player B can just do weird stuff and get completely back into it. It's always exciting. And I, the tip that I can give you is sometimes it can be overwhelming seeing your opponent do a lot of stuff when you're playing old school. Never give up. Continue till that last card. Continue till your life total is on zero because you can always come back. And let's see if Averett can, uh, can get back here. I mean, he's still in a pretty vulnerable position with five in the Ankh on board. Looks like he's thinking about eating up the Ankh here so he can play a land. And I, I can understand for Avery, it's kind of hard to eat the ank because it's part of your of your strategy as well. So, you know, I wonder if he's got, for example, a vice on hand uh, in hand. He's playing with, I believe, three black vice main. So he, uh, if he can play a vice here, it will mean some damage for Carl. Yeah, he is going to eat up the ank. So that means plus two, plus two for the Atok. There's a volcanic island. That means eight cards in hand, I believe. Tapping. There's the black vice. I was kind of expecting this to drop. I wonder if he's also going to eat the Mox and then attack with the Atog. Although I'm not sure if that would be a good move because then probably Carl's just going to double block it. So you would trade your Atog for a Suchi basically and it would also cost you one more extra artifact. So 17 hand. Yeah, so Aver decides not to. I can understand. I think that's a good decision. Anyway, three damage for Carl is going to drop to eight. I mean, perhaps if you would have had another, like, Atok in hand, you could consider making that trade. Then again, your new Atok will be worse because, you know, you, you have two artifacts less. But now it's uh, Carl's turn. Let's see what he can do. Of course, took the damage from the Vice, so he's on eight. And I mean, he's playing, I believe, three bolts? Or was it two bolts? Three or two bolts, and he's also playing a Fireball. So, I mean, Fireball if he has one in hand, would get him really close to uh, to killing Avertir on the spot. So I'm sure if he has a Fireball, he's going to wait one more turn because then he could uh, play out land number five and he would have six mana in total. He could play the burn spell for five. Carl, of course, wants to also empty his hand. I mean, he's only on eight, right? It's eight against five. This is really a thriller of a first game. So I think if, if you're Carl, you want to try to play a little bit more out than just the land, or else you're stuck with seven, you would take three damage next turn again, you would drop to five. In that case, both players will be on five. Ooh, look at this, there's the attack, going full, going all in. And actually, it kind of makes sense. I would be tempted to also attack with the factory, depends on what you have in hand, because, you know, Averett is on five. He can maybe take one hit max, you know, let one Suchi go, go to one. So that means he probably have to make some unfavorable blocks. There's the animation here. And I wonder how he's going to block. Is he just going to block everything here? So he's going to block it before damage is dealt. He's going to eat it up to the Atok. Also feed him the Emerald, meaning he's probably going to kill the Suchi. He's going to chomp the line on the other one. Yeah, so what he did here, which is quite nice, he animates the factory... Declares the block, then before damage is dealt, he sacks the factory to the Atok, meaning that you've, you know, blocked another Suchi. Another copy artifact. Wow. That is crazy. Another copy. So many Suchis here on the board. And another wreck. Why not? Just because he wants to empty his hand. Of course, four cards in hand now for Carl, meaning no damage. What I really like here is that Carl first attacked, kind of giving Aver the idea of. That vice is a problem for me, you know? And now you see after that, he starts playing out his hand and the vice is actually not a problem at all. So I think that's a really good decision because of course that does influence the decision-making of Average, you know, choosing what to sack to the Atok. Anyway, this is kind of his last turn. Again, only one Atok looking at four Suchis on the other side of the board. Doesn't play with Wrath of God. Balance would be nice. Oh, look at this. It's gonna take care. No, he's going to win it. Direct damage on on Carl. Wow, Carl had this in the bag, but that direct damage. I really needed a moment here to process it. Carl, of course, being on eight. Psionic Blast, four. Bolt makes seven. Another Bolt, that's 10 damage. When you're on eight, it means the end of the road. But it's just game one, though. So both players are going to dive into their sideboards. Oh, man, what an exciting game one. Hopefully, game two is going to be just as good.
Game number two, here we go. So it's one game up for Averd. That means Carl on the plane. Here we see Averd. It looks like he's taking a mulligan here. Taking a last look at the card, bottoming it here. So he's starting with six. Carl on the plane. Here we go. Let's see if they can have an explosive opening again. Yes, he can. There's chains of Mephistopheles hitting the board. So the enchantment from Legends. And let's see if he can take advantage of that next turn. There's a plateau into Savannah Lines. So some pressure here by Avert. Avert also passing the turn back to Carl. So Carl drawing his card for turn. Let's see what he can do. There is a Mishra's Factory tapping the Mox Pearl. There's Dirac. So he's got two of his main ingredients now on the board. If he can find some kind of way to force Avert to discard his hand, then he's in business. Let's see what Avert's going to do. There's a Tundra, so that's the blue and white duel. Are we going to see an attack by the Lion? If so, he's kind of signaling to have a Disenchant or a Bolt in hand for that uh, factory. There's the attack for two. Carl not uh, hesitating at all, taking the damage. Going to drop to 18. Are we going to see something else? Perhaps an Ankh of Mishra here by Avert. Or an Atok, of course, one written one. It looks like he's going to pass. We see Carl here uh, writing down the score on paper as well. And we'll just have to wait and see what's going to happen next. For a moment there, I thought Avert passed a turn, but perhaps he has more options. It looks like he does. We're going to put both duels on top of each other. Does that mean he wants to tap them to cast something else? An Ankh would be quite nice here for him. The more damage and the quicker he can do them, the better. That's what his deck wants to do. There's a Divine Offering. So he's going to gain a life, going to go up to 21. So that's quite nice here for Avert. Taking care of the uh, of the wreck. That means even if Carl has some kind of like Winds of Chains or, you know, Time Twister or something, even if Avert empties his hand, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to mean damage for him. So we just see a land drop and a pass. There's another plateau. <clears throat> what are we going to see here? Three mana now. I guess the first... Okay, there's another line. I want to say the first question you got to ask yourself is do I want to attack with my Savannah line? I really wonder, is he going to put that one line into the red zone? Nope, he's not passing the turn. And I think if you're Carl, you're quite happy with this, because if Avert would have attacked, then Carl had to make the decision, do I want to put my factory in front of it or not? Does that mean that I think that, um, you know, that Avert doesn't have a bolt or a disenchant? Now, of course, we do see here in Carl's hand, if you look closely, that he's got a blue elemental blast. So he brought that in from the side. Looks like he wants to do something on end step. There's a psionic blast on one of the lions. So, um, yeah, I mean, Carl apparently not really happy, happy with the lions. <laughs> Playing a psionic blast on it. I wonder if that means that he's got some sort of draw seven in hand. Oh, he's got a mind twist. Mind twist for three, twisting away here the hand. Wow, so we saw a Chaos Orb, Suchi, and a land gone. That Suchi would have been quite good next turn. Could have dropped the land, played a Suchi. And of course, Chaos Orb also being huge. That could have taken care for, with, for example, the chains of Mephistopheles. We do see the attacker with the line. Averett kind of in top decking mode now. So again, a mind twist found here by Carl. Three cards in hand, passing the turn. Two cards in hand here for Avert. Three cards in hand for Carl. It's going to tap three or not. For a moment, I thought it was going to tap all three. What could he play for three Wheel of Fortune that doesn't work with the chains of Mephistopheles? So just passing the turn. Perhaps he had a psionic blast. He was considering playing that uh, to the dome of Carl. Carl just playing a factory passes back here to Avert. There's a pearl and a pass. So both players kind of top decking. 
And if your Carl, you could consider attacking here. He doesn't, but you could have considered attacking with one of the factors because you can pump it with the other. But uh, both players just passing for now, trying to kind of build up their hand size. Very patient players. And I guess that's a quality that you got to have if you want to make it far in these tournaments. You've got to know when to deploy your sources and when not to. There's the rack. Are we now going to see a draw seven because we have the change of Mephistopheles? Yes, we do. Mind twist. And now we're going to see the change of Mephistopheles in action. And I believe that what's going to happen, they just have to mill seven cards now. So they're going to shuffle their hand and library back into, sorry, their hand and graveyard back into their library. And then instead of drawing seven, they've got to mill seven because they have no cards in hand. So Avid here should take his uh, graveyard and shuffle that back in as well. Pretty sure somebody is going to uh, point that out. Or is that his sideboard, perhaps, those cards over there? So now he's going to mill. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So this is a really nice demonstration of how Chains of Mephistopheles works. And I think he forgot to shuffle those cards back in, by the way. So pretty interesting that, that that's the thing, you know, you have so many experienced players and both of these players are very experienced and very good in the game, but you still kind of miss things. It's really interesting when I'm making these videos that even at the highest level of old school, Things are simply forgotten, you know. There's so much pressure on these games, and, and you probably focus on, hey, what is this change of Mephistopheles now going to do with the Time Twister? We did see, uh, by the way, uh, Aver taking damage from the wreck, so the wreck now being active again, of course. So Avert on 18, still pretty high, but I mean, the problem here is because of the change of Mephistopheles, it's going to be really hard for him to refill his hand. Looks like there's an attack for four, animating both the factories. That would mean Avert's going to drop to 14 unless he does something. Having one card in hand, of course, perhaps there's a Bolt in there or a Disenchant. I think if it's a Disenchant, though, you would go for the Chains of Mephistopheles. Going to tap two. Oh, a Psionic Blast. Has to tap three, right? Exactly. The problem with, of course, a chain, uh, 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 a Psionic Blast, I mean, is that you also take two damage yourself. It is, of course, good because you would have taken two anyway from the, from the factory. Going to take more damage here also from the rack, of course, so you have that as well to uh, to keep in mind. I guess you're going to want to, yeah, I want to say maybe you want to keep the line on blocking duty, which, which sounds odd, but, you know, in this case, okay, there's a disenchant. Okay, now it kind of, in a way, makes sense as well that you can get rid of the, of the wreck. Going here for the wreck, by the way, not for the change of Mephistopheles. Of course, he's got to think of his life total. He's on 11. I think if you're Carl... Yeah, of course it depends on the two cards in his hand, but I would be tempted to just attack, put him on 9 here. Then again, if this is going to turn into a top deck racing contest, Avert's deck is probably better at it, having more burn in the deck. But I mean, I would be tempted to still kind of attack. Let's see what he's going to do first, though. There's a Demonic Tutor. Wow. So is he just going to pick up another rack, play out the rack? I think that's what you want to do here. So that means he would drop to eight. Or does he have a better option? Going to go through the graveyard like, oh, my card's in there? No, it's not. It should be here. I really wonder what he's going to go for because the ancestral recall is not going to be very useful with the change of Mephistopheles. What did he get there? By the way, Demonic Tutor, because it's not a draw effect, uh, it's not affected by the Chains of Mephistopheles. So there are kind of some ways to work around the Chains, I guess. Untamed Wild, Wilds, for example, is a card that could work around the Chains of Mephistopheles. Just the past turn, I really wonder what that one card is now. I kind of thought it would be the Rack. You know, that would have meant that Avert would have dropped to 8. I mean, I don't know if that's worth it. Probably he, he, you know, picked a better card. So I'm just really curious to see what that is. There's a Black Lotus, Cracking the Lotus. 
Tapping. Oh, Sheevan Dragon coming in from the sideboard. Wow, what a boss move. You can also see the box here from Avert. And I mean, I think he looked up the Black Lotus, by the way, to then cast the Sheevan Dragon. Wow, this is amazing. And uh, that's probably also because Aver or Carl knows that Avert is not playing with... Um, with Swords of Plowshares in his deck. He's playing Psionic Blast and Lightning Bolt, so it's going to be really tough for him to get both in his hands with the Chains of Mephistopheles. That's it. So Carl winning here game number two in an incredibly cool way. So props to you, Carl. It was really nice to see your deck here working on full cylinders, and I'm super happy because it's 1-1, and that means we're going to go to game number three. Game number three, here we go. The winner will move on to the finals of this tournament, Knight of Thorn 10 in Davider, the Netherlands. And here we see, look at this explosive start. Wow! Insane. Insane. And what a good opener here for um, for Avert. Yeah, he's taking a photo of his own play. I understand, man. You, this doesn't happen often. Although old school is the place where this does happen every now and uh, now and then. But yeah, this is ideal with that time twister. You know, you're just going to shuffle everything back in, going to draw a fresh seven. And maybe if he's lucky, he's going to find a mox and a vice. Could play that out. That means instant damage for Carl. So uh, yeah, wow. What an opener here in game three. And what a good start for Avert. I mean, this is, uh, this is the opening kind of of dreams here. Both players here piling up, drawing a fresh seven. Well, let's see. And I mean, the thing is, this is also difficult for Carl because now he gets a, 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 a hand of seven cards that he cannot mulligan, right? So it could be uh, it could be pretty bad for him. Anyway, there's the pass of Avert, so didn't find a Mox and a Vice, I guess. So we do have a land here for Carl. That's good. A Mox, it seems. Mox Jet here. So taking damage, of course, from the Ankh. Going to drop to 18. Let's see what else he can do. Okay, there's a Soul Ring. Maybe a Surrender Befreed here. No, the Wreck. Going to tap two more. Okay, and there's a Chaos Orb. So this is a pretty good hand as well. For Carl, three cards left. Passing the turn. And I mean, that's the thing with Ankh of Mishra in this format with, with the Mox and the Soul Ring and all the other artifact mana and also mana dorks like Lana War Elves and Birds of Paradise. Sometimes the Ankh simply doesn't work because your opponent can just play out lands in a different way. Here we see a land draw by Avert, by the way. Should take two damage here. Drop to 18. Also, of course, Avert has that Soul Ring, so he's got four mana to work with here. Yeah, now he's going to drop to 18. And I mean, this is this is all pretty tense right here in the semifinals. Like, the, both of these players are so close now to the finals. And they've been playing cards the entire day. Like, you shouldn't underestimate this. You, you come at these tournaments at 10 in the morning, you sign up. You know, you have a coffee maybe. And then you just start jamming games. And, and I mean, now it's 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock or something. And you're still playing. In between, you're taking a few beers, having a heavy lunch. Like a quick bite to eat, probably, because it's all in between the games. So these are long days for both of these players. Here we see a uh, Divine Offering on the Chaos Orb. And a copy artifact here. Oh, nice on the wreck. That is interesting. So an interesting choice here by Aver. Think, you know what? I'm going to copy that wreck of yours. So if you empty your hand, you'll be in trouble. Interesting play. Could have, for example, also chosen to copy one of the Moxen or the Soaring or maybe his own Ankh. But I like this. Going for the wreck, it's funny. It's, it's something probably that Carl didn't expect to also play against another play with the wreck on the table. And I believe he now has four cards in hand for Carl, so, I mean, he's pretty safe. Both players are, by the way. Avert also having, a, like, a pretty full grip of cards. It seems five, I believe. So Carl doing some calculating 
Are we up for some more fireworks here? And both players are not playing with any counter magic. So I always find it kind of reassuring, you know, when my opponent doesn't play with counters, I can just play my stuff, I don't have to worry. Of course, they do have a lot of answers in the deck, but at least it resolves. So there's, I believe, a copy artifact in hand there for Carl. That's one of the cards I can identify. We know he boarded in the Sheevans. I wonder if he kept them. I mean, that was just a beautiful way of winning in game two. It's just phenomenal. Anyway, underground C here, he's going to drop to 16. <laughs> What is that red card? Was it a wheel in hand? I mean, he could consider wheeling. That would be quite cool. Then we've seen a Wheel of Fortune and a Time Twister in the deciding game of the semifinals. That would be uh, pretty exciting. It looks like he's thinking about it. Or does he have another option? Maybe a Surrender Pefrit? He plays two of those. What are we going to see? The tension, the tension, the tension. A copy artifact. Okay, copying the soul ring, it seems. Going to tap his mana a little bit different. So he's got a soul ring now. Got one mana floating then still. There is the Wheel of Fortune. Sheevan Dragon going into the bin there. Wheel of Fortune there in hand as well. And an Ancestral, and Hercules Recall, not an Ancestral Recall. So Hercules Recall, I believe, coming in... Or is he playing that main? Not quite sure now. We'd have to check the deck list again. Anyway, both players drawing a full seven. Yeah, this is really an exciting uh, semi-finals. I'm just so happy. You know, I love these games that are so close. Both players are doing a lot of cool stuff. And here we see uh, Carl playing Change of Mephistopheles. That means he's got the two cards now that he wants to cook with on the table. The Change of Mephistopheles and the Rack. So if he can now find, for example, a Winds of Chains or, you know, a Time Twister of his own, it'll be uh, trouble for uh, for Avert. Now, do remember, Avert, of course, also has the Rack. That one copy artifact is the Rack, so on his side of the board. So that uh, makes it quite interesting, both players having the Rack. And Carl being on a lower life total here is uh, Lance is going to drop to 18. From his own Ankh of Mishra. Going to tap two. What are we going to see? There's a time walk. And there's a Suchi. Yeah, this time walk is quite good because now he can hit with the Suchi. And he's got, of course, also the factory. So could potentially deal six points of damage. Now he's going to take his extra turn. Yeah, this is looking quite good. He could get Carl to 10. So there's the factory. No, it's going to tap three. Yeah, one to animate, one to disenchant the chains of Mephistopheles. Attacking here for six. It looks like he's kind of taken over the game here. Game number three. Two turns in a row for Avert that have been quite explosive. Managing to play the Suchi, get rid of the chains of Mephistopheles. And deal six damage. Carl now on ten. And Avert still pretty high up on eighteen. But Carl does have a lot of mana. Doesn't have the second red, though, to, you know, potentially play Sheevan Dragon. I believe he's got two Sheevans in the side. I think we also see a Hercules Recall in hand for Carl. Not quite sure. But his hand is it's pretty full, so I'm sure he's got a lot of options here. Taking his time, of course. He is here in the semifinals. The deciding game. His life total has been halved. Remember, there's an Ankh of Mishra here on the battlefield, so playing a land also takes two points of life. Looks like he wants to tap four. Does that mean he's got a Suchi in hand? The CMC of Suchi, of course, is four to four, four from Antiquities. That would be quite a good play for him because it means he can block the Suchi and the factory if Aether decides to attack with both. So Carl here really taking a moment, knowing that, you know, making a mistake here could be vital. <laughs> Fighting for his life here at the Knights of Thorn in the semifinals. <laughs> Going here through the hand again.
Averett still on 18. Looks like he's putting two cards on the side there. Tapping four, tapping five. Are we going to see a mind twist, perhaps? A mind twist would mean that then the wreck would get active again. But it also means he would take another six. Next turn, he would drop to four. And of course, in response to the mind twist, Avery could maybe play some direct damage. He's going to play the Hercules Recall. Interesting, so he's going to just get a lot of mana. Play the Hercules Recall, get all the mana rocks back, play them out again. And of course, and he'll net extra mana. So this is kind of a way to to create mana for himself. Now I wonder what he wants to do with all that mana. That's of course the big question. A big fireball perhaps? He plays with one fireball. Oh, look at this. I like this using the Loa as well. So that he can start drawing cards with the Loa. Wow, this is a really creative way to get an active Loa, right? Playing your Hercules Recall to get to seven. So I guess he had eight cards in hand now to play the Soaring. I guess he's got seven or not. And he still has mana floating, I believe. Like, we, I don't know. We can't hear the audio, but... Gonna tap a land. What else is he gonna do? The problem here, though, for... Okay, gonna play a copy here. I want to say the problem is still the, the Suchi and the Factory on, on the side of Averts board. But, I mean, with this copy artifact, he's got defense. Copying the Suchi here... Now he's going to draw an extra card, having seven in hand. And we do see two mocks in hand there as well. So he could draw his extra card, play a mox, and pass the turn. That's one of the lines he could follow here. Okay, he's got the wreck. Still has mana floating, apparently. Taking the wreck back, though. Going to play a mox ruby instead. Passing the turn. I mean, what a fun... Oh, Divine Offering. That is not great for Carl. As a matter of fact, that could mean the end of his tournament life here. This is huge. And that's a big problem I have with Suchi. I mean, a lot of people say that Suchi is overpowered in Swedish, but in a lot of cases, it gets you know killed by a Divine Offering and your opponent just takes four life. Anyway, here's the attack of six. We do see a bolt here. That's very important because that means he's not in bolt range. He's going to drop to four. Are we going to see a psionic blast to finish it here in the semifinals? I guess not or else Avert would have played it out already, I'm sure. Looking at his hand, four cards in hand here. I mean, perhaps he's thinking about playing a bolt, but I'm, I'm sure if you have a bolt, I wouldn't play it now. Why would you? I would just pass and exactly try to finish it the next turn. He's on four. Whether he's on four on one doesn't matter that much at the moment. And Carl, of course, taking an extra card with the Loa. But this is tough for him. You know, remember he plays two Serenips. Perhaps he boarded those out. Though. Oh, and here we see Carl extending the hand. So that means that Avert is winning here in the semi-finals and he is going to continue to the finals. Congratulations, Avert, for reaching the finals of the Knights of Thorn 10. And of course, also a big applause to you, Carl, with your Chains of Mephistopheles making it all the way to the semis. That is quite an accomplishment, if you ask me. And uh, in the finals, he's going to play against another Belgian player. He's going to play against uh, Gwen and we saw Gwen uh, earlier already in the uh, in the quarterfinals match, we showed that match last week, and the finals I will be showing that next week. Now, if you don't want to miss a thing, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell, because then you will be notified whenever I post another video. And uh, there are a few more things you can do uh, before you leave. Please consider uh, supporting the show by leaving a comment. Um, leave a like and share this on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. So please consider doing those uh, those small things to help the channel uh, take the next step. And talking about taking the next step, you can also become a patron of the show via patreon.com slash timmytalks. The cool thing is if you become a patron and it already starts for just $1 a month, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll.
Sumba Kazik.